24. Sounds good. Okay. That down. All right, going live on 24. And going live on YouTube. Nice. All right, so this and live. we we'll start in a second. Just making sure it goes through. Do you seem good too? All right, looks like everything's good. Looks like we're live. Fantastic. You want to kick us off? All right, well, welcome everybody. Absolutely. Uh, uh, hope you're doing well on this fine Wednesday. Uh, good morning, evening, afternoon. Happy time zone. Uh, we're excited to talk to you today about Nomad. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot going on in this 1-1 one, one release. And uh, if you're curious about what some of those things are, you found yourself in the right place. Um, yeah. Uh, today, you'll be joined by myself. My name is Taylor Dolezal. Uh, I'm a developer advocate here at HashiCorp, and I'm joined with my colleague, Jackie. Hello. Also, I think we might not be screen, uh, screen sharing the slides yet. Oh. Well, well, well. That's well. okay. That, uh... We can definitely do that. Let me go ahead. Like it's not as important right now, but when we get to the other stuff, but <laughs> poor people are like, what, what graph? <laughs> Graphs overrated. Um, awesome. Let me, let me go ahead and do that. Screen share here. Now you should see two people's faces, and that happens to be Jackie and myself. Uh, hopefully it's not showing any bank information or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> we, we should be good on that front now. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it looks like we're good. Uh, thank you for kicking us off, and you know, sorry for interrupting there, but um, you may have seen me before on some of these like webinars or community office hours. My name's Jackie Grinrod. I'm a developer advocate here at HashiCorp, and I typically work with the Nomad product. So. These are kind of the events you usually see me at. Um, in the past, I've had about five years of experience as a DevOps engineer, just kind of working on pipelines and infrastructure and lots of orchestration things. Um, otherwise, yeah, now I'm here. You can find me on GitHub at GoGoCoco, and you can find me on Twitter at DevOpsJackie. How about yourself, Taylor? So you can find me on uh, on these platforms uh, as only Dole, just about anywhere on the internet. Uh, like Jackie, uh, you know, work here at HashiCorp, but mostly focus on infrastructure, uh, application delivery, developer experience, and uh, just many other things. I, I've done a lot of work as a site reliability engineer and working within infrastructure, uh, but earlier on in my career, I focused on software engineering and some things on that front too. But uh, when I'm not coding, I do like reading and finding some fun new books. Uh, my Goodreads goal this year, I think, is 26 books, um, uh, or, or no, I upped it to 30. So I'm looking for more books. If you can find some or if you know of some good ones, I'd be happy to hear about those. But uh, yeah, should be should be fun today. Uh, Nomad 1.1 documentation has kept me uh, quite busy on, on reading up on things lately, though, I must say. <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, some of the things that we're going to be covering Today, uh, first off, uh, then go into Nomad and just kind of get a, a little bit of an introduction and understand some of the things that it does a little bit more, a little bit better. Uh, and then finally, we'll get into some demos to, to cover some of those 1.1 .1 features. So when it comes to uh, our community guidelines, uh, you can read more at hashicorp.com forward slash community dash guidelines. Uh, really what this simplifies down to is please be excellent to one another. Uh, when working in the community space, uh, it works best when everyone's able to hear one another, uh, we're able to be respectful of one another, and it just goes such a long way when you're able to have meaningful conversations with people. So uh, please be mindful of that uh, as we enter into some of the discussions today and as you engage in chat on, uh, on YouTube and, and some of our other platforms. Uh, so this is Nomad that we're talking about. So this is a good vibes space. Nomad, uh, just good vibes. So I uh, uh, hope you all are ready for some, some fun today. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Jackie here to, to get us started talking about Nomad as well. Sounds good to me. Yeah, Nomad, just glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we knew we were going to make these jokes, so here we are. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about the new features we have coming out in the 1.1 uh, feature preview. And I think, some, as Taylor's kind of pointed out, that it's just kind of, we want to have a good vibe space. We're just here to share some new things with you. A lot of people kind of come together to create the tools that we're talking about, the features we're talking about, whether that's our engineers, our community members, um, we see all kinds of other support. We have our cloud SRE team is also heavily using the product. So it's it really is based on the community and we're really happy to be here kind of talking on that front of things. Um, but yeah, that kind of brings us into Nomad itself. Um, as he mentioned with the overview, we're gonna do a quick kind of overview of what Nomad is and then we're gonna get into some of the new features and some demos. So one of the cool things is that there's kind of 80 plus company, 80% 80 of companies are deploying containers across multiple clouds, which is, it's a really large number. There's a lot of people, a lot of places going into this. And 40% um, of those companies cited complexity as the number one challenge in their container deployment. This is mostly just here because, well, it's, it's a problem that people are facing and we just kind of want to talk through that a bit. Um, deployment cho choices are more diverse than ever. There's more options and you don't really have to be limited to just one or really whatever you've been using before. There's lots of things to kind of try and get to see how it goes. Um, so that brings us into a little bit about, we did a 2 million container challenge uh, last year. I think that was the end of last year. And it was pretty cool. We ran this challenge a few years back as the 1 million container challenge. We did it again as 2 million containers, and we ran it across a bunch of different regions, um, scheduled over, again, 2 million Docker containers on 6,100 hosts in 10 different AWS global regions. That only took 22 minutes, and that's pretty cool. Um, if you wanna find out more about it, we have blog posts, we've done community office hours talking about this with Schmeichel, where he talked about a lot of the really cool details that went on behind the scenes and in the building of this. So feel free to look into that some more if, you, if you're interested. So getting two into a bit more, a, uh, sorry? Two million is a lot of containers. Um, you know, sometimes I have trouble just standing up five on my local machine. So that's a, a huge kudos. <laughs> it's all efforts on that front. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's so true. Sometimes it goes really well. Sometimes you're just kind of like, well, all right, we'll make this work. It'll, it'll work. <laughs> um, generally speaking, of course. <laughs> So that kind of brings us into Nomad's guided principle, which it really is just to orchestrate any application. Um, we want you to be able to orchestrate things, like we've talked a bit about containers, but we want you to be able to use the same workflow, whether you're using containers or whether you're running your own binaries. Um, just kind of making sure that you know your workflow feels similar, your steps are similar. It means that you've got more time and energy and effort to be able to put into other problems that you're solving. So getting into use cases again, I, I already talked about this on the last slide, my bad, but it's <laughs> kind of talking about how we can do container orchestration or non-containerized orchestration. So yeah, I think we're good to go on to the next slide. Um, did you want to talk about this one or do you want to talk about the orchestration one? Uh, I'm happy to talk about orchestration. That, that totally works for me. Perfect. Thank you. I'll just keep going then. So let's talk about some core concepts as far as orchestration goes. The idea is that you want to be able to take a lightweight single binary and kind of just run it. Um, that would be with you know our non-containerized applications. Basically, you get the binary, um, you have a server that has their agent installed on it, and you just kind of run it there. You can use the, the servers kind of where all of our scheduling happens and the clients where things actually run on. So you can do single region architecture where we just have our cluster on one region and everything's great. It just runs there, but maybe that's not really the use case we want to do. Um, maybe you work in a company where you need to have multiple regions or I don't know, maybe you're in healthcare and different regions have different requirements. So like in Canada, you have to have data residency if you're doing healthcare here. Basically, if you want to do a multi-region setup, that's something we can do too. Um, we have a way of being able to connect the different clusters together and then they can run. Yep. <laughs> So that just brings us down into the core concepts. Um, basically what you're looking at is we've got the smallest unit possible is the tasks. That's where we schedule our work, probably our binaries, uh, maybe a Java application, maybe some batch processing. Um, a group would be a group of these tasks. So a group might look like having maybe your task that's running like a web server and a sidecar that ships your logs off to 
an actual logging cluster or maybe like console connect sidecar you might even have like a service that has its own single database related to it the idea behind a group is that all of these pieces that you need to go together go together and you can kind of scale them up or down together as needed um, which brings us into the next layer is jobs so that's how we declaratively define the deployment rules for applications um, so you might be talking about things like is it a batch job what kind of driver are we using it is it binary is it docker containers maybe we want to run five of these uh, groups maybe we want to run one stuff like that goes in that layer and yeah so let's talk about orchestration Yay, one of my favorite topics. Uh, very sad that they didn't have any courses on this in, in uh, college or uh, or in high school, but you know, here, here we are. Uh, when it comes to working with Nomad and orchestration, there's a lot of things that go on, right? Um, Nomad is available to help solve a lot of the problems around managing the in-between space of your application and the underlying operating system or systems that you're running on. Um, uh, orchestration is applicable because sometimes that might be containers. Sometimes it might not be. Sometimes it might just be a single binary or, you know, or just kind of a uh, combination of things on that front. And Nomad is here to help. Uh, if you have some work that you need to get scheduled on machines, uh, Nomad can definitely fit the bill and help you out on that front. Um, so that uh, so like we talked about that works for containers and really the value is such that nomad provides you that singular interface to work with um, despite whether something is containerized or whether it's not you can use nomads orchestration features to handle both of those kinds of workloads which are uh, quite quite helpful that also helps you when it comes to zero downtime deployments or any like uh, different application deployment strategies as well. Um, that's going to make your applications a lot, uh, a lot more resilient because you don't just have to worry about that one process on that one machine that might go down. You can use Nomad as, as a wonderful layer to help out with uh, you know, figuring out what the best strategy is for your company, your deployment, uh, and your runtime as well. This also helps you get more out of the machines that you already have. So without having to do any major retooling or anything like that, just by having Nomad alone and using that as your orchestration uh, method within your company or your team, you can actually get more performance out of your machines already. Uh, which, because uh, you know, normally if you just run an application, in most cases it doesn't really care about your CPU, your memory, uh, you know, network things like that. Uh, and and uh, that's where Nomad can really uh, pick up the bill and help out on that front. In terms of uh, bin packing or spread scheduling, there are many different workflows, right? So if you want to get maximum performance out of your machine, you might want a bin packing method, which Nomad supports, or you might just want those jobs to get finished as fast as possible. If you're doing high-speed trades or trying to get those expense reports filed, um, you might want something like spread scheduling, which is going to go ahead and just make sure all of that work gets, gets scheduled as fast as possible. Uh, try to say that five times fast. Uh, I, I definitely know I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, kind of moving more into workloads, uh, Nomad is a modern orchestrator that supports many different workflows, uh, all of which are to help your business and your projects get scheduled appropriately, right? So what's great about uh, you know working at HashiCorp and seeing all of the ways that Nomad integrates with things are uh, it integrates so well with all of our products. Um, if you want to use it with console and help cluster your Nomad, uh, your Nomad cluster together in a more automa automated way, you can use console. If you want to help manage secrets, uh, Vault integrates quite well. If you want to set up your configuration using Terraform, that works as well. Uh, for, for all of our products and all of our integrations, there's, there are wonderful ways to get that into your Nomad cluster and set up that configuration. So. Um, yeah, if you start using one, uh, chances are it's, it's, you, it, you can get more help out of checking out the rest of the suite of our tools. Awesome. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Jackie, for 1.1. Uh, and uh, what, what, are, what are some of the features that are coming out in 1.1? Sounds good. There is a lot of them. Uh, we're going to be doing three different demos today. Uh, so in this section, we're mostly going to talk about the features that you won't be seeing in our demos. I'm realizing I'm doing all these hand gestures and nobody can see me, but <laughs> it's fine. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so there's, a, there's a lot of really cool things in 1.1 that are coming out that just really enhance kind of your usability and your day-to-day -day experience, as well as some features that are really good for like running either bigger scale, bigger, I can't, I didn't write any speaker notes for this part. So we're, we're doing our best with words here. <laughs> <laughs> So as we've mentioned, we will be covering some of the autoscaler improvements. Uh, we will be covering CSI with Ceph is our second demo, and our third demo is going to be focused on memory over subscription. Um, there's a couple UI improvements we've made as well. Um, you can find most of the answers or most of the information I'm sharing on this blog post. I'm going to send it in a back channel because I don't actually have YouTube open on this computer. I've got two computers running right now. Um, but other things you can expect to find in 1.1 are we added, so we added some fuzzy searching so that you can kind of search through and find different services or allocations easier. Um, we've added resource monitor monitoring on both the client level as well as on your alloc and task level. Thank you. I saw you'll share it in YouTube. I appreciate it. And um, we've also added readiness checks. So. The big difference here is that there's liveness checks and there's readiness checks. The reason you want these um, is with your liveness check, it'll tell you, hey, your container's up and running. But your readiness, will ch readiness check will tell you, hey, your container's up and running, but also it's ready to receive traffic. The, so a good example of this is maybe you've got a backend server that needs to come up and do some database migrations or something along those lines before it's actually ready to accept traffic. So it's going to refuse everything until it's done its set list of tasks it needs to do. Um, that would be a really good chance for you to use something like readiness where, you know, you don't want, send, you don't want to send anything to it before it's actually ready. Um, yeah, we've got, we've got some remote task driver work that's been done. So you now can use Nomad to manage your workloads on more than just Nomad. So you could use things like AWS Lambda or Amazon ECS. I did actually see some comments in our, I guess, promo posts before that folks are interested in Amazon ECS demos. So. We'll have to take a look into that outside of today. We're not going to be doing a remote task driver uh, demo today. We've got some more enterprise features that have been added around console namespace support and license auto loading. And then we've got for, I'm going to talk about this later too, but we've got some more auto scaling improvements as well. Um, let's see, I'm missing one. I am missing reserved CPU cores. There we go. So this is pretty cool. I actually had a really nice rundown of it from <laughs> and checking out the RFC with this. It's, it's been a neat feature to look at. But basically, the idea here is that if you have some key tasks that you really want to make sure that they never share their resources, they always run, they're mission critical. Um, what you can do is you can add a line into your file that just dictates how many cores are going to be reserved for it. And it'll just run on those cores. So part of the reason this is important is if your tasks, as like if they get scheduled and orchestrated across multiple cores, it increases the, I guess, latency between your tasks and can kind of hit, there's like performance hits there. So you're just making sure it's, it's always there, it's always got the resources it needs, and it's not going across different cores or machines. And I believe that's everything I had for this slide. Awesome, awesome. I know that our first demo is going to be auto scaling. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And uh, uh, yeah. yes, it is auto scaling. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's demo time. <laughs> demos. I love demos. <laughs> demos, please. <laughs> oh, all right. Oh, and the, thank you for adding that GA link as well. Okay. Absolutely. Let's get a screen share going. Um, I should probably open my links really quick. This... Let's see. Awesome. And yeah, so let us know I'm if you're- I'm trying to split uh... my two demo windows, but yeah. What were you saying? No worries. I, I saw some uh, I saw some people asking about where the demo is being shared. Um, you should see both Jackie and myself right now. Let us know if you have any issues uh, seeing any anything, and and we can get that handled. But I think everything looks good now. But uh, might have, might have just been my screen sharing uh, going wonky at the end, which you know. Are... It happens. Let's see, I'm just dragging some things over. You should not see my screen share yet. Um, just making sure that everything's where it should be. 
if you have any fun uh, demo prep ideas or traditions or rituals that you have, uh, please share those in the chat. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be fun to hear about some of those. Uh, personally, uh, I like to make oh, myself a, a cup of yerba mate tea. Uh, we have some mango honey out here uh, uh, by me, which also uh, just it puts me puts me in a good mood right before right before a big demo and things like that. But uh, yeah, if you've got any fun tips or tricks, uh, we definitely definitely like to hear about those. Okay, let's uh, let's see how it goes. Yeah, I would love to hear about your demo tricks as well because uh, I am a very nervous live demoer. So here we are, very <laughs> nervous, and we're going to screen share and just hope that uh, everything goes as it did in the other three dry runs. <laughs> um, where is the screen share button? I think it's up. Uh, it's up like in the green bar in the top right, there it just is. to the yeah. Okay. Oh, I love that people Ooh. are answering our question for demo traditions. I'm going to have to read that after I actually demo, but that brings me joy to see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we got into this demo, I've already gone ahead and run my Terraform. There has been no manual changes. Um, I should probably, I'm going to have to link this to you on Slack again so you can share it into the chat itself. Of course. I meant to grab this link in advance, but you know. Um, so what, what I'm running here is a fork of the autoscaler demo repo that we had before. There's just been a couple Terraform changes. Um, I'm just sharing this so that you can kind of see it, and th there's no like smoke and mirrors here, I promise, like, is basically what I'm saying. Um, so I ran my code earlier. We've got the Nomad UI up, we've got console, we've got some other things up as well. I'm just showing you here that these are the ones that are up. And even though this is in Canada Central and I'm Canadian, I swear I did not pick this to be based on loons. Very Canadian animal. Autoscaler has one failed, so I'm a little nervous. We'll see how this goes. Little bit nervous. This was not failed earlier. Um, that's okay. We'll see how it goes. I feel like people like seeing demos that go poorly too, so we're hoping. <laughs> um, so the plan <laughs> here is I'm going to be running through the on-demand batch demos, which you can find in, I think it was linked in YouTube now. Um, I ran a Terraform out apply and put that up. And what that actually was creating is two different sets of clients, which you can find based on their node class. Uh, the first set is running our service and system kind of jobs. So you know things that you might actually want to run on a system level for your cluster. In this case, we've got Prefix job for traffic in ingress. We've got Prometheus for scraping and storing the metrics. We've got Grafana for the dashboards and also the Nomad Autoscaler. Our second set of clients is more running our actual, actual applications. So it's going to be, in this case, instances of a dispatch batch job. Um, the number of clients here is going to be completely dependent on how many different batch jobs are in progress. So initially, there's no batch jobs um, running or enqueued. So we expect to see that there are no clients in this node class. Um, just to kind of, again, verify, I'm still really nervous about that one failed autoscaler. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, yes, we're having a good time. I've got to export my variables. I've got two different nomad environments at the moment. Oh, that's getting choppy. That's OK. We're fine. Do a nomad job status. There we go. So also, if my terminal is too small, let me know, and I will zoom it up. <laughs> I love the comments. It just means it's real. I appreciate that. Yeah, this is, this is a live demo, all right. <laughs> so as you can see, we've got our autoscaler, our batch, our Grafana, our Prometheus, and our Trefix services are up and running. Um, so that's great. Uh, and we're just going to also show using nomad node status. We've just got the one node that's up. Um, if I run this again later, what you'll actually see after it's killed them is that we'll have two different, at least two different nodes that come up and they'll show, I think down was the status, um, but they won't be ready and they're not there right now because we haven't ran the job yet. So before we get into actually running the code, we're gonna see if I can go over to the correct, this is not the correct VS code open, that's fine. Where is it? I've got like three right now. Hmm, here it is, cool. Okay, so this is the batch job that we're gonna be running. Some things to keep in mind are it is parameterized. So we can dispatch it multiple times. We can kind of give it some different commands. 
Um, it's restricted to only run in a specific class. So a specific node class is what it's going to be running in. And it also requires a large amount of memory. So each instance of this job is going to be requiring a full client to run on. Um, if we go down to our template block, we can see that scaling policy is described. Let's see. Yeah, there we go. Um, so every 10 seconds, what's going to happen is the autoscaler is going to check how many batch jobs there are. I'm actually in the wrong file. We're fine. We'll just keep going. Oh, this one's not pretty. It's not formatted. That's OK, too. <laughs> Everything is fine. Oh, <laughs> yeah? What, one, qu one quick question I had from uh, I saw from the audience, Jack. If you wouldn't mind bumping up your uh, text size just uh, just about. I think, I think in yeah, terminal. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, is it the terminal that needs it? One of my it? favorite okay. requests. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> like, if you can't see it, let me know. I've got a bunch of different monitors going, and they all show it at different sizes. So by a bunch, I mean four. I literally have four monitors right now. Uh, let's see. <laughs> and if I'm going to bump it up to here, if that's not better, uh, just let me know, and I'll bump it up again. Absolutely no problem. Um, OK. Perfect. Where was I? Oh, this is the wrong wrong demo. That's the next demo. We've done this already. <laughs> All right, here we go. We're in our <laughs> template block. Um, I started talking about this, but I was on the wrong file. It is OK. Every 10 seconds, the autoscaler is going to check how many batch jobs are in progress by querying Prometheus for the sum of the number of instances that are queued or running. So that's how we're going to find out what we need. Um, and in this specific case, we're actually going to be using the pass-through strategy, which is one of the new 1.1 ads is that we can now use different strategies. Um, so there's going to be no extra processing, and it just passes straight in the number that we need. The number of batch clients is then going to equal the number of batch job instances in progress. Um, we're using a node selector strategy, which I'm trying to find. I should just really, there we go. So we're using a node selector strategy that defines how the autoscaler is going to choose which nodes are going to be removed when it's time to actually scale the cluster, like scale it back in. Um, this is really important because you don't want to kind of get the wrong clients deleted. So what we're using is empty ignore system. This means that we're only going to remove the clients that don't already have running allocations. Again, important because we don't want to disrupt our batch jobs in the middle of them and then maybe have them restart somewhere else. We don't want to waste the resources or the time on that. And we don't want to possibly get into like this mixed middle state of a task running. So ideally, we only want to kill them after they've finished their job. Um, and to also just as a note, to avoid over-provisioning, we've set a max attribute uh, to five. Let's see if I can find that here. There it is, yeah. So we've got a max of five. We want to make sure that we don't get more than five clients. Um, just a note with auto scaling, it's really important to make sure you know what your mins and maxes are so that you don't end up with like an overnight $12,000 bill. That's not specific to Nomad auto scaling so much as just like a general rule of thumb for auto scaling. Such so a from good there, <laughs> let, yeah, I've got so many auto scaling stories. Oh, it's opening the wrong one. Is this the right one? Yeah. Um, I'm still nervous about that red line. That's okay. We'll be fine. Or we won't. That's okay, too. <laughs> so we'll go into the dashboard. As you can see, we have no jobs running. We have nothing queued. There is our number of clients on this side. We've just got one client, and we've got zero batch jobs. This is, this is good and expected. So let's actually run a command. Uh, if I can find my terminal again. I have so many windows open. <laughs> Here we go. So we're going to run an actual command, and it says that it's failed to place all allocations. This is completely fine and working as expected. Um, what it's saying is that there's no clients in the batch node class to satisfy this constraint. And what we should see if we come over to here is we've got one job queued, which is good. This is expected. It's not running because there's nothing for it to run on yet. But this blue line in our Grafana is indicating that the autoscaler has realized it needs to scale up a client. So as soon as we ran it, it went, hey, I don't have the space to run that on. Let's scale up. Um, so that is expected. It should take a couple minutes probably to spin up. What it's doing is it's creating EC2 instances in the background right now. We're going to run this two more times while we wait for that. Um, I'm hoping I did a big enough gap this time. Last time when I dry ran this, I uh, did them all at once, and we didn't get the actual stepping effect that we were hoping for. 
So yeah, dashboard now displays. Oh yeah, I did a little too fast. You can see how it just jumped straight from one to three. That's okay. The dashboard is now displaying that we've got three instances in the queue. Um, we should have one running very shortly, unless of course this is the failure that I saw earlier. Um, we're hoping that this is fine. We'll come back to that. We'll see how it does. Um, generally, the total number of instances that's in progress right now, well, they said generally, but it's right now is three. Um, so we should be seeing the autoscaler scale things out, which would be over here. I do not see it scaling out. Let's see. The good news for this demo is that if I do happen to have it broken today, it has already been done live and I can just point to a recording of it live. I would prefer not to, but live demos. I'm just going to give I think it a moment it, when, here. Yeah. When it comes yeah. to workloads like this, Jackie, are there any examples that you can think of where where these type of workloads are really useful? Um, you know, I've, I've, I think I've, I've I've heard of a few you know batch jobs and things like that myself, but I uh, wasn't sure if you've had any experience in dealing with that or talking with practitioners that that use this type of pattern. Yeah. Um, oh, there's the, okay, the clients are coming up. Oh, I feel so much better. But <laughs> <laughs> as far as what kind of workloads you might want to run this on, there's, there's all kinds. Um, something that I personally worked with was when you'd want to have like nodes scaling out like this, a really good example is CI pipelines. Uh, maybe you have a job, um, I'm completely pulling on past experiences here, but we had this job that was very, very heavy processing. Um, it basically did pixel by pixel comparisons of forms that we generated as we worked for hospitals. And it was really important that those were pixel by pixel correct, because of course, if you mess it up, like all the forms change and everything. So what that meant was this job was very, very heavy to run. And the machine it ran on was of course, very, very heavy. Um, that would be kind of a, a case where maybe you want to only have the clients up while you're actually running that job and you don't want the server just running all the time. Um, other examples, of course, would be if you're doing something like ETL pipelines, um, anything that's really like a heavy amount of tasks in a short period of time, that's about when you'd want to kind of do this. So let's see, I'm seeing it queue that it's scaling up. I think I might just need to accept that it is not going to do the clients today and point you to where that actually did work. Is it a live demo? Something went wrong or didn't go wrong? Probably not. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, wait, there it is, maybe. That looks like it's there. Nice. There it goes. Look at that. I'm just not being patient enough. That's okay. <laughs> it's like I feel like, but but you know, they say never let never uh, a watch uh, a watch <laughs> pot never boils. You know, but I feel like that like a, a watched dashboard never <laughs> scales might might be applicable too. <laughs> but it's so fun to look at, and it's I, yeah, you know, it's definitely. fun to spam refresh. Yeah, I think the ecosystem team has done an excellent job. I think it's ecosystem and Charlie that have worked on this. I think it's uh, a great demo. It's so good. It's I, I I've gotten into a couple of cases where um, we've had a stampeding herd issued. A few companies I've worked with where it's either like this or um, there's a feature on an application someone wants to see and they spam the refresh button and so does the rest of the team. <laughs> um, so <laughs> those are those are fun problems to solve. Like it stopped when you all came over here to tell me about it. That's very that's very weird. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, and just as we're watching this, so some of the strategies that we've added with 1.1 are the one that we're using, which is the pass-through strategy. It allows users to defer scaling logic to their APM of choice. So in this case, we are using Prometheus to grab those numbers, but you could be using something like Datadog or really whatever solution that you have. Um, a second strategy we have is the fixed value, uh, and that one maintains a fixed number of nodes. So say you always want to have five nodes, that's how it works. Uh, and the final one is the threshold strategy, which lets you toggle different scaling strategies based on a tracked metric and whether or not it's in the defined range that you've had. Um, I do see we're going a little bit further on time than I intended to with this demo. So I'm probably going to hand over here. Um, 
the demo did work. Thank you. I see YouTube chat and I, I appreciate your support. <laughs> but Yay. what we would see next in the rest of this demo is it's going to, as it has stepped up on the right hand side, and you can see it starting to step down on the left hand side, it's going to do the same thing with clients. Um, as the load, as the workloads go through, they're going to finish, and then the autoscaler is going to go, hey, we don't need that node anymore, and it's going to start scaling them back in. Um, I will link to another, oh, nice. Yeah, I'll link to another version of this in chat, uh, but I'm going to hand over here for you. Fantastic. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and get my, my setup going here. And again, you should not see uh, any sensitive data or bank information. Uh, hopefully, if, if everything works correctly, <laughs> you should see my editor and, uh, and my shell. Uh, I still have to, I, I see a lot of people just use VS code in that single, you know, that single view. Well, I haven't gotten to that point where I feel 100%, uh, you know, in my element there. So uh, but someday, someday, some, at some point in time, I'll have it all in VS code. Um, so when uh, one of the other features in 1.1 is integration with CF, CSI, uh, and which is the Container Storage Interface, and Ceph. Um, now, not Ceph like Rogan, Ceph as in storage. Um, I had to had to <laughs> say that many times yesterday while we were practicing. But uh, yeah, or if, yeah, if you know of a Ceph Rogan, that's that's a, that's yeah. Let us know because that'd be a cool person to know. Um, my demo today is going to be inside of a Vagrant uh, machine, so I'm actually going to use Vagrant and stand up my machine right now. Um, I've gotten rid of it, so we'll take a little bit of time to get started here, but uh, that just gives us time to talk about what's coming up in this demo. So really what we're going to be doing in this demo is um, after this machine gets started up, we're going to be, uh, we're going to have a Nomad cluster of one. We're going to have console, uh, and then some other things uh, available to us. So you'll see that I'm port forwarding a few, quite a few things. That's just to give us visibility and I can show you in my browser all of the services that I'm starting up locally, which is gonna be helpful. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and wait for this machine to get up and running. Um, I'm then going to stand up Ceph. I'm going to do that inside of one Docker container. Now we are experts, so please don't do this at home. Um, if you do this at home or in production, uh, it's not something that's going to last, right? As soon as that starts, you're going to lose your data. Um, so this is uh, uh, not advised for production unless you're looking to do some, uh, maybe do some chaos engineering or something like that, right? Uh, but uh, definitely, definitely not suited for production. After we get Ceph stood up. I'm going to install the controller um, to so that Nomad can actually talk to, using CSI, can talk to Ceph and go and stand up storage for us when we make requests to do so. Um, that's what these two run plugins are. Uh, and then we're gonna make sure that everything comes up and works as we want it to. Um, we're going to have to handle authentication to Ceph as well. Uh, we're going to go and get the key, uh, the key ring value for that, uh, and then finally use that, put that into our volume HCL file, and then stand up that volume, and then just uh, and then show you that we can see that in the UI and uh, and the CLI as well. So with that, uh, right on time, Vagrant has come through and set up my machine for me. Uh, let's go ahead and validate that, shall we? Let me grab a uh, a uh, browser window here. Uh, I pipe this through to localhost, and so I should be able to see the Nomad UI. Fantastic. Uh, I should also be able to see the console UI. And, uh, and you'll note this is local. Uh, this is not exposed to the world, so sorry, can't follow along. Uh, this is just on my machine for right now. So we have this all set up. Uh, I'm going to uh, SSH into my Vagrant host so that I can look at the demo code, which I have mounted in here in this machine. Let's go ahead and go into CSI demo, and we should see all of the files that I'm going to need today. And we do, fantastic. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and run this run Ceph script. And uh, you can see there's not, not, not too much going on here. What this is going to do is, uh, is apply this job file for Ceph to run on Nomad. And then it's going right now in this waiting for Ceph to be ready. It's actually using console uh, to make sure that that service is up and running. Where you can see these new services have been added. 
and we're waiting for Ceph dashboard to come online. Uh, we started that out as failing because we we want to be we want to make sure that it is uh, in good standing. And typically, right when an application begins, it's not in good standing, right? So uh, while we wait for that to get instantiated, um, well, you can see it running here uh, as well. So we'll just wait for that just a little bit. Uh, sometimes it takes like 30 seconds, 60 seconds to get up and running. Uh, Jack and I were joking about, um, you know, Jeopardy theme music or the best hold music you've ever heard as maybe potentially being some worthwhile features to ask for uh, while you wait for things wait, is to, this, to Is this my cue to hit the button? So, I can hit the button. Uh, I th yeah, I, I think it might be a good idea. Yeah, this it seems to be taking a bit of time. Um. <laughs> We joked about it, and I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny. But uh, awesome. There we go. So Seth is okay, up I'll and stop running. It. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, one thing that I piped through uh, as well was the Seth uh, dashboard. So we can actually see that this is up and running. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is, this is as we expect. This is, this is good. So now that Ceph is up and running and we can take a look at that dashboard, it's registered all of its services, the next step that we're going to run is going to be uh, installing the plugins for Ceph so that Nomad can actually work with them. So I'm going to go ahead and here, I'm going to pass through these two commands. Uh, one's going to run the nodes, and then one is a controller to actually interface with the CSI. Uh, we'll wait for those to uh, start up. And we have a wonderful watch command right here. Um, oh, one thing to note. Uh, this is in the demo repository that we shared at the beginning of the talk. However, uh, this is currently in a feature branch that will be merged in uh, at some point in time later today. So if you do want to test this out, uh, you can either check out the branch that I have uh, currently or you know, just wait a little bit, and then we'll actually merge that into main. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, very curious to hear what your experiences are, and you know, if you if you do use CSI either within your cloud, uh, within the Ceph, uh, we heard some people asking about Cinder uh, and some other use cases. But uh, if you have a favorite CSI uh, method of creating and working with storage, uh, you know, put in put in chat. We'd love to hear about that too. Uh, if you have any questions about that, it'd be fun to take make note of and then you know talk about in some future sessions as well. All right. Uh, this also uh, does take just a, a couple seconds, and uh, perfect. Uh, see, if you don't look at it, it goes faster. I don't know how that works, what physics are involved there. But uh, <laughs> awesome. Schrodinger's shell, I think, is uh, the, the, uh, what we might be dealing with here. Um, OK, fantastic. So that is up and running. Uh, we can see the allocation that we want. And next, what I have to so I'm all ready to to add my volume and make sure that Ceph uh, uh, is able to work with it. So what I'm going to need though is to authenticate to Ceph. Uh, I need to find um, what is it? I need to take a look at my shell and go to Ceph. So uh, I can see all of my jobs running by running Nomad job status, right? So if I go Nomad job status, and I supply that name of that job, I'm going to get more information. Uh, what I'm actually looking for is this container ID, this identifier within Nomad. Uh, then I'm going to be able to do, uh, I'm going to be able to run this command. Go ahead and copy it, because that would be a little bit faster. Oh. And jump to the start of my shell. And by running this command, I'm actually executing this on the, actually, I need to get that ID, that in here. Fantastic. OK. So this is the key ring value that I need to uh, actually authenticate with my Ceph cluster. So I'm going to go in here into my volume HCL. Uh, you can see that I've got some pretty straightforward things here. You know, it's test one, test volume. Um, and then I'm going to go in here. This is ephemeral, uh, so you know, please, please uh, don't steal my password. But uh, you know, this is on my machine, and this uh, is ephemeral, so be deleted quite quickly. Uh, definitely not worth doing in production and sharing with the world. I, I, I'm my dad. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, I've updated this volume. I've made sure to save it, which is uh, always fun during a live demo if you forget to do so. Uh, 
and let's go ahead and add this. Boom, we're done. We're good to go. Uh, so we've added a volume uh, using CSI and Ceph. Uh, if we go to Nomad volume status, we can see that we have this test volume here. If we want to go into the Nomad UI, we can also see that we have this volume. We can see our Ceph plugin as well, and then we can click into here. So no allocations just yet, but uh, uh, now you can stand up things with, uh, with CSI and Ceph in 1.1, and that concludes the CSI demo. Thank you for following along. That was a lot of fun. Uh, again, let us know if you meet a Ceph Rogan. Uh, it would be a fantastic mascot for this feature. <laughs> Very true, very true. <laughs> oh man, demo number two, here we go. <laughs> Yay. This will be our, our, our hat trick. This will, be our, this will be our third one. Indeed. Let me just verify that we've got the right things open as usual. So I've been answering some questions behind the scenes while you were demoing. All right, so we're going to talk about memory over subscription now. Um, how do I want to specifically run this? <clears throat> I think I should be fine to run this job, and then we can talk over it. It might be like famous last words. We'll find out. As you, can, I forgot to clear this. As you can see, I've been running this demo a lot and practicing. <laughs> we're just going to clear that so that we can only see what I do while we're actually live, which is pretty much going to be the same thing. Um, right, I've done a whole different demo. That's fine. <clears throat> There's something about typing and knowing people are watching that makes you suddenly forget what the commands are called, but it's okay. <laughs> so getting into uh, memory over subscription, we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to do this. Um, so typically your apps would have a pretty steady memory footprint, but there's times where they might have like occasional spikes. Uh, so for example, kind of talking about that backend server or your web server that might use maybe say 250 megabytes of RAM typically, but there'll be occasional spikes for unexpected load. Maybe your website's been shared a ton on social media and you did not expect this. Um, and that's going to last up until the end, right? So you want to make sure that you don't have an oom error or like crash during that. Another case is maybe you're running some batch jobs and at the very start or at the very end, they're a bit more memory intensive uh, than the rest. So you don't really want to scale for the spikes themselves because it means that you're not getting to use all that other headroom the other times that you're running applications and maybe you could spin pack a little bit tighter onto the machine that you're actually using. Um, and, but if you set it like at the wrong spot, basically you're either going to have your application prematurely killed or you're going to have too much memory that's not getting used. Um, so it's, it's disabled by default, right? Let's come back from that step. We'll, we'll catch up to that one. So typically it's disabled by default and you actually have to go ahead and up, um, enable it first. Uh, in this case, I can tell that it was enabled by curling it and getting the response back. Oh, that's so slow. There we go. My computer's scared, it's stressed. <laughs> so as you can see here, we've got memory over subscription enabled. We've turned it on already. Um, that was just with a different curl request. And for the demo we're using today, we're actually gonna be leveraging Nick Jackson, who's another DA here. He's got a repository called Fake Service, and it's great for demos. Um, we're going to be just using the API from it. Yeah, as we go, let's, let's just go ahead and run it. So we hit run. Um, as this is coming up, what we've got is we've got an API service, and we've also got a load testing service, and they're both deployed in here together. Um, and so the load test is basically going to be hitting our API and doing its best to kind of imitate regular traffic. I've closed my uh, window. That's OK. That's fine. We'll just get a new one and go over there. <laughs> Hello. This one, we're it's gonna a, get a it's local a Maxo. host. <laughs> yeah. So Windows might Max. be hard. Oh, we don't want to drag to a new. That's fine. Come on, you can do it. Go to the desktop. There we go. All right. 
So. Okay. Mm I'm getting all the fails today. Let's just instead, we're going to purge it out. We don't like the state that it was in. We don't think it's where we want to be. We're just going to stop it and purge it out, and we're going to redeploy it. <clears throat> so we're going to do a run. We're going to redeploy our API. I'm going to come over to here. All of the earlier failures from probably while I was doing the other parts of today's webinar, to be honest, I probably left it running and it got upset, um, which is expected. All right, we're still failing. Hmm. Let's see. Got load test, API. Where is my new API? <laughs> it's here. Is it just, why is it failing? What did I change that is failing things in the last hour? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, live demos. <laughs> That's all I got to say. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go look through the code then, I guess, while we're talking. The plan was, yes, OK, that was expected. This is actually working as expected. It's just not running it again. Interesting. OK, we'll come back to that. That's fine. We'll talk through the code first. Where'd my code go? So let's go over to here. Um, what we've added in is liveness and readiness checks to kind of get that started. We're not going to talk too much about that today, though. Um, I have changed my restart attempts to be 10 so that it wouldn't actually do what it's currently doing, which is uh, it restarts twice. Um, it was just pre previously set to two with a 30 minute inter interval. And what was happening is it would kill it twice and then it would just stop because that's kind of expected. If something keeps on failing and failing and failing, you probably don't want to keep running and taking up all of your resources. Um, so what we've got is we've got these variables that say what kind of memory requests are going to go into it, how much memory is loaded per request, uh, the variance of how often that will happen, as well as the variance of how large that load is actually going to be. Uh, we're using this version of Nix fake service. So that's just us pulling from there. And um, we've got a CPU value, and then we've also got our memory value. So what we're expecting to see when we deploy this application is it should go up to the memory value, and then it's actually going to give us that error that we saw in the browser, this oom killed. This is expected. This was actually working as expected. It looks like half an hour ago. Um, we're going to try running it again and see if it, well, I guess let's do a nomad status first. And I'm pretty sure we're on the right cluster, but just in case. Yeah, OK. So we're going to stop and purge it again. as I pause and make sure that I'm in the right repository, but I am because it wouldn't be the API job if not. I'm gonna double check my code one more time. We've saved again just because I'm paranoid and what we should see is I deploy it and we should see this job running and we should be able to look at the new graphs that have been added. This probably actually needs to get zoomed up too because it's a different window. So we'll do that while we're here. I'm gonna do a nomad run. Oh, that's a typo. That's fine. That's another same typo. <laughs> We're going to run the API. And we this time are expecting it to see it running. If it doesn't run, well, that's the first time I've had this error. And I guess that's just where we're at. So preferably it runs. But I don't really know. It is not running. Hmm. OK, well, I semi-prepared for this to happen in terms of taking a screenshot of what it's supposed to look like. Let's, I guess, find that really quick. Is of course, on my other monitor. I'm going to stop screen sharing for a second <laughs> as I open Slack to pull up the image. <laughs> I, s I still don't know how you do it with uh, with with so many screens, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really awesome. 
Yeah, I don't normally have this many screens, but what we're running today is essentially a double stream. We're, uh, we're doing a webinar on, on 24 and then we're capturing that and we're actually, I've got another monitor all the way over there that is capturing that and then streaming that out to YouTube. Um, so I'm just gonna open my screenshots and go from there. So I can at least show you what it's supposed to look like when it runs and I guess I'll troubleshoot this after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting messages to look at the logs and I'm, I'm honestly really nervous about doing a demo. I'm more nervous about troubleshooting the demo live. Um, we could try it. I might like freeze up a bit because yeah, live demos kind of scare me. But <laughs> we're just gonna, let's see. <laughs> I'll take a look at the logs quickly. We'll see if it's like obvious what the problem is. Um, We're actually not getting any logs right now. That's that's fine. It looks like the API itself doesn't want to run. I'm going to check for a typo really quick while we're off screen, and I'm less nervous about typing generally. <laughs> Taylor, I shouldn't have done the I dry run. I used up all my demo luck in the dry <laughs> run. <laughs> <laughs> I did see. It's. I, I just think you have to roll the die again. If you roll over an 18, I think you might have more luck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just need a nat 20 to make this work out. Uh, let's see. I, I think the only thing I've changed did, is the I did see from, so from Charlie in the chat. Mm -hmm. I did see from Charlie in the chat that he said, uh, you're failing too fast. But by lowering the interval, uh, you can make uh, uh, a perma reef. If you fail more, more than X times in Y interval, it will fail forever um, in the absence of reschedule, if, the, if that's of any help. I think he said stop and purge ah. the whole API job, should be able to restart it. Okay, let's try it. We'll screen share. Let's give it a try. Are you kidding me? Is it running or is that? Well, it's running anyway. So I, I don't know what happened there. We're just <laughs> maybe like, it's yeah, not. Yeah, see that. Just rolling no, it's dice not. again. It's not. So that was you. a that was a fake. Okay, let's get that screen share back up. <laughs> uh, worst case scenario, I'm going to show you the screenshot from earlier and apologize that it doesn't run. Um, hopefully it does, but we'll find out. But that that would make sense. The uh, the retry interval is actually the only one that I've changed since I ran this earlier. So we're going to go back over to here. Um, hello? Wrong VS code. <laughs> there we go. I've changed it back down to two. That's what we had earlier when it was running. Um, everything else should be fine. We've got memory max turned off. Nice. OK, we're just going to, that's actually not the one I want to do. I want to do a stop. We're going to purge it. And we're going to run it again. If it doesn't go from here, then we're going to we're just going to share the screenshot, and I'm going to talk through it and apologize. So, <laughs> not much else to do in that case. It looks like it's doing the same thing. That is most unfortunate. It is not placing allocations. Well done. Mm -hmm. as I click it and go maybe now. It doesn't even look like it's taking the API one in properly this time. All right, well, we're gonna open Slack and uh, <laughs> here's <laughs> roughly what it actually looks like when it runs. Um, the idea behind this application was that we wanted to have it simulating more of a regular traffic. So what we wanted to have is you've got your 100%, we want it to generally be below 100%, and that way, when it spikes, it will give the um kill message that we saw in my logs earlier. Um, and then after that, what we'll see is that we've got this space and it spikes. So the next step would be to go into my terminal is this memory max setting. So what this is actually doing is it's saying that you can spike above 100 and you can go up to 150 without getting um killed. Um, so this is good for, as I said, kind of trying to bin pack as much into it as you can and just making the most of the resources that you have available to yourself. We're going to try running it again. I don't think it's going to run uh, if it's not running right now. Uh, how she goes. Oh, I think Honey, we made uh, a joke about how maybe it wouldn't run last night. We'd have to call Nick Jackson in and I think we jinxed ourselves. <laughs> I just going to mess with the server.
I do, in fact, have a message from Nick, so we'll see what he's got in DMs as we're going. Um, let's see. We're going to open some Docker as well on the side. I just want to check some stats while we're doing this. I'm a little bit nervous that maybe I've got just too much stuff running memory. I don't know right now. That's up. That's running. Let's go check the dashboard again. Oh, OK. All right. Well, it's here. <laughs> um, sure. Yay. Cool. Yeah, I see it as well this time. I'm not really sure what happened there. That's fine. Oh, a container running on that port. That's a possibility from earlier. I think that, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Kill any fake services. Starboard. I will do that <laughs> if we get to that point again. <laughs> oh, I thought I had Slack notifications turned off. That is fine. Yeah, I can see it. It's here. Um, it's running. We should be able to see it spike above 100% without getting killed now. Doesn't look like it's spiking as much as it was. Hmm. I think I I do remember it's it would it, with it being random. I do remember it taking about like thirty seconds to sixty seconds to. to yeah. Jump okay. On well, that front, I'm gonna try but, running uh, it one more time, seeing as it's actually going in. Um. <laughs> Nick, hello world. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. I thought I had it. I had it on do not uh, pause notifications, but that seems to have automatically turned off when my meeting ended. That's fine. We'll, we'll try running it one more time. We'll see how it goes. If not, then, you know, live demos. I'm going to run it one more time. I'm going to go back to API. Let's go back up. Seems to be here. We go in. We'll click in and we expect to see it um kill. We're getting close to um kill. This is actually, I think, what we were planning on using the Jeopardy song for was this part where we were waiting for it to spike. <laughs> it's like, I'll take schedulers for 800. Yeah. I'm starting to think that there's something else maybe going on. It looks like it's doing some spikes, but not as high. I mean, there's a chance that with all the streaming stuff I've got set up too, that things aren't allocating the way they were this morning. <laughs> yeah, I know the, the CPU is higher now than in the dry runs that we had done before yesterday, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to... I don't know. We'll try one more thing. I promise this is the last thing I'm going to try. Uh, let's see. Which value do we want to change? Let's bump up the number of requests happening at the same time. Did it just kill while I was tabbed out? It did. There you go. <laughs> of course. So it killed at 100. Oh, geez. My computer's starting to slow down, too. This is, this is oof. And we'll just, we'll turn this on. Right, one more time. So it did kill as expected. We're going to run it again. Yeah, so I've been reading chat. I'm just catch I'm back catching up on uh, the YouTube chat right now. I've been reading chat, but there's actually Slack uh, on 24 and YouTube chat coming in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, demo gods, please, right? <laughs> All right, let's get back to the API. Let's click into our new running one. And we should see the spike above 100 and not get killed because we've got max memory enabled. 
like, ooh, I do like those values. We're waiting. Yeah. And thank you so yeah, much I've for sticking of, around. Yeah, uh, I've seen a lot of Yes, thanks, true. Thanks for, uh, th thank you so much to everybody for sticking around. I know it's been a uh, uh, wild and fun morning in terms of hearing about everything Nomad 1.1. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to check out the uh, uh, uh forum that we have, uh, discuss forum. Uh, if you have any questions or if you want to see what other practitioners are talking about, it's a fan plastic, fantastic place to check out. Uh, as well as learn.hashicorp.com. Not only do we have uh, learning tracks about Nomad, but about uh, all of our other products. So whether it's working with a specific feature or if it's a um, just a kind of a learning track a repository as well. So uh, stay tuned on that front if you want to see any examples or, or follow along at home after the session. And then um, feel free to uh, feel, please at us if you have any questions on that front too. But uh, I, as we draw to a close, fantastic to see you all. Thank you so much for showing up. I wish I could give you a high five in person, but uh, hey, maybe soon, right? <laughs> exactly. It's hoping we'd get our spike. Please just give me one spike above. <laughs> Will we do it? <laughs> All right. This time it's going a little too close to 100. Oh, was that it? Please tell me that went above 100. <laughs> Ooh, I think, yeah, I think we hit. Just under. That's OK. <laughs> It's like playing bingo. <laughs> Participation. Like bingo. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so the idea is we will spike above it, and then it's not actually going to um kill it. Um, we have this demo available if you want to try it on your own as well. Um, that's just how, I guess, live demos go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop screen sharing, and I'm calling it that as soon as I stop screen sharing, it's going to actually do as we're expecting to see, but that's OK. <laughs> well awesome uh again <laughs> thank you all for for showing up uh we are at time and so uh unfortunately i uh, won't be able to go through uh, uh any q a today but uh please uh but that doesn't mean that we won't uh we, we don't want to hear from you to add that to discuss uh we do have in uh in youtube chat we've made note of some of those questions as well as everyone that's on on 24 uh we have those logged as well and we can follow up with you on that front but uh thank you so much for for joining today jackie do you have any uh parting words of wisdom or uh, uh mantras or anything like that <laughs> that you'd like to share with everybody well yes i called it <laughs> the second we stopped it spiked <laughs> above the allocated amount and did not kill it <laughs> oh, <Yay. geez. laughs> it's right over here here it is again here's another spike that exceeded it all right we made it <laughs> <laughs> um otherwise any parting words of wisdom well, that's a good question uh i mean what's coming up next is we're still going to have some more day-to-day -day improvements for 1.2 the team's still working very hard on trying to get everything together and we're hoping to get some more ui experiences as well as remote task driver improvements in um as far as anything else i had let me see if you wanted to find the blog post that we referenced or the demo code that we have used. Um, I think we shared it as we went, but I'm just going to drop it in one more time for anybody who's looking to have it. Uh, we did just drop a link for HashiConf, which is coming up on June, uh, between June 8th and June 11th. Uh, so please uh, feel free to register if you like, uh, if you like talks like this, if you want to hear more, uh, make sure you register. It's free uh, and it uh, should be a lot of fun. I think our uh, uh, developer advocate team's very own uh, Kareem Satirly is going to be one of the MCs, so it should be, uh, should be fun to see. I'm very excited for him MCing. I think it's going to be really fun. I had a blast doing last year's, and I think he's going to have a great time. Um, OK. Yeah, otherwise, I think that's all we really have for today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And 
thanks for your patience as we go through the live demos and we hope to see you the next time we have one of these as well. Uh, again, if you have any questions, concerns, feedback, feel free to at me at DevOps Jackie. Um, Taylor is only Dole. And with that, uh, have a nice day and thanks for joining us. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Have a good one.